it is February 17th. This is Senate Government Operations. And um, today we are looking at S-147, which is um, a bill that would uh, create a, ask the state to create a language access plan for all the agencies and departments. Um, we have walked through it and had some testimony on it, but um, today we're going to be looking at it again. What I'm going to do is start off by having the committee introduce themselves because many of you aren't with us all the time. So we'll start off. I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Hi all, I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Keisha Rom Hinsdale, Chittenden County. Thank you. And today we have with us both some, but a closed captioner who is making sure that um, the captions that go out are actually what we're saying because we've had instances where the uh, standard closed captioning that just happens by YouTube or however that happens is very often way off mark from what we're talking about. So this is, um, we're having a special closed captioner today and we have an ASL interpreter with us. And we welcome all of you and all of the people who are here with us. So I think that, um, first of all, let me ask if anybody has a time constraint so that they would need to um, leave early or get on first. Laura, did you? Uh, the, the interpreter is only scheduled till 2.30. Okay, so I think that what we'll do then, I think we'll start with um, Laura. Laura, would you like to start off? Because we wanna make sure that you get your testimony in while your interpreter is still here. Thank you, and I'd be happy to do that. I really appreciate being here and being asked to testify. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're most welcome. So again, my name is Laura Siegel. I'm the Director for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services and Deafblind Services through the Department of Disability, Aging and Independent Living. And that is within the Agency of Human Services. So first of all, I wanna thank you Senator White and Senator Hinsdale for speaking to this bill. I also want to add gratitude to Senator White for what you said a few weeks ago regarding American Sign Language and how deaf people do not identify themselves as disabled. I fully support your remark. Every person has the right to identify however they wish and use whatever language they are most comfortable with. The population that I serve, deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind individuals are just as marginalized as other minorities. People who pr pr primarily use American Sign Language are part of a linguistic and cultural minority. English and ASL are two distinct languages with their own grammatical structures. And just like assistive technology or captioning services, ASL provides access to information and a method of communication. As you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act exists, but many people lack basic knowledge about the ADA and what reasonable accommodation truly means. When we fail to provide language access for people who rely on this access, we can cause misunderstandings, miscommunications, and disrupt their ability to engage in their communities. Not providing this access violates the ADA. As currently written, S-147 omits American Sign Language and other assistive forms of communication or translation. Two weeks ago, Amelia Murda-Zanovonik 
the director of USCRI mentioned Nepali Sign Language. Other countries have their own versions of different sign languages that need to be recognized. ASL is considered and recognized as a foreign language nationwide. Tide, according to Title 16, Chapter 23, Subchapter 001, ASL counts as a foreign language credit in our Vermont school systems. A comprehensive language access plan should address non-spoken languages like American Sign Language, and the current bill does not have it in there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Laura? But I, before we jump to questions, I'd like to just um, make an observation here that um, the, the um, deaf and hard of hearing and deaf blind community tends, as you said, to be kind of invisible to, to many people. And when we were doing a bill a number of years ago after the closure of the Austin School and we were working on this, it was really exciting to have people in the cafeteria who were signing with each other and very visible. And it was, it was just really exciting to see that couple tables worth of people who were chattering away with each other and was something that we don't see in the in the state house very often. So thank you. Um, and I'm just happy that you had that exposure. I was there that day and, and very fondly remember it. Thank you. So I'm gonna to go to Senator Collimore and then Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for that memory. I remember also when the bill came up on the floor, I think I even remember the bill number 166. Um, I learned how to sign the word yes, so I could <laughs> vote. Of course, we have to say it orally in order for the microphones to pick it up, but we're also able to sign yes. And it's just one of those memories I have. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. Yeah, it was, it, you're right. It's a very memorable day. Uh, Laura, thank you for your testimony. Wonderful to have you. And uh, I uh, assume we will add this to our bill. Um, one question I have for you is uh, also help us understand how big this community is in Vermont. If you could put numbers to the number of deaf, deaf blind, and hard of hearing, what is that population in Vermont? Because it would be important for us to know. I'm happy to speak to that. According to the Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deaf Blind Advisory Council, in their legislative report that was recently published, it states that there are about 65,000 to 125,000 people in the state of Vermont who have hearing loss. We, um, but I also suspect that in full disclosure, that there is uh, there are more because as a marginalized population, they don't necessarily self-identify. There is a very negative stigma associated with hearing loss and with folks who are in a linguistic and cultural minority like deaf, culturally deaf people. Yes, Senator and, Clarkson. And the deaf blind community, what are you incorporating them into that number or are they a separate and distinct group? According to the Helen Keller National Center, they inform me that uh, the adults on record is about 44 deaf-blind individuals in the state on record. But that was last documented. That data is from 2014. So it is a bit uh, outdated. Yeah. And then according to the New England Consortium of Deaf-Blind uh, and their project, they told me that there are 38 deaf-blind children in our school systems. So you're looking at roughly around 100 deafblind individuals in the state. Is that helpful? Thank you. Thank, thank you. We did, We one of the things that we did here when we were doing this um, before, after the closure of the Austin School, that we had a number of young families moving out of state because they simply didn't have the services for their children in um, and there, there was, 
there, they were put into uh, schools with interpret with one one on one aides who couldn't sign, and there just were no services. So we lost a lot of people, I think, <clears throat> about, about the time of the closure of the Austin School. Yes, that is correct. The number certainly did drop exponentially, which is very, very unfortunate right after the closure of the Austin School. Mm -hmm. However, there are many communities who are starting to partner and to work on lifting up their consideration for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And, and part of my role is to help those communities make those connections and note gaps in services uh, on a statewide level. And there's, there is quite a bit of work to be done in that respect, but I am, I am here and I am working as hard as I can. Good, thank you. So, oh, Senator Ram Hinsdale. Um, Thank you. So, so first of all, I, I want to apologize as the original sponsor of the bill for this omission in the original language. And I think it's just important for us all to be able to acknowledge when we've fail and failed or fallen down on being as inclusive um, as we hope to be with something of this magnitude. Um, and I really appreciate that we've already started talking about the intersection of other spoken languages um, with, no, with non-spoken languages. Um, you know, I think it's an area where we'll need to grow in many ways as well as a state. Um, I wonder, Laura, if there are best practices in emergency communications, particularly, or other areas of life-saving or life-threatening communication um, that you think are really important for us to think about. And then finally, I just hope you can, you'll, you're able and willing to help us make sure the language gets where it needs to be um, to include the culturally deaf community. I am more than happy to help in any way that I can crafting and navigating that language for the bill. Um, you are correct that it, it does need to be um, as detailed and accurate as we can make it, and I'm happy to help. Regarding emergency services, there is uh, a myriad of things that you can do to provide uh, access and communication, communication cards being one, obviously interpreting services for any press conferences or anything that's in the public eye or in the media, providing captioning services like you are doing today to ensure that emergency messages are captioned accurately. So those are just a few things that come to mind right away. Yes, I just wanna ask um, if I try, even though they were not fully representative conversations, I tried to start having those conversations in terms of uh, communities that were um, verbally spoken language minority communities. Did how do you feel that experience was during during the early stages of the pandemic, where communication was taking place quickly and urgently? Um, what what was the experience of people you talked to around getting emergency information that they needed? Hmm. So it was very unfortunate that the deaf community had to write a petition to convince the governor's office to uh, provide access to the press conferences. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work that needed to be done, not only in providing sign language interpreters, but ca closed captioning for those press conferences. Um, and so that was something that was a big consideration for us. Uh, I think if there had been an effort to be more proactive for both spoken languages and sign languages in the beginning of the pandemic, that fear of misunderstanding and miscommunication uh, may, may have been much more alleviated than it was. I think setting up a plan for a common language and a common protocol for when these emergencies happen would really benefit everybody. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, providing that access to deaf Vermonters and to the communities that we serve, I think really would be ideal in an emergency situation. Thank you. Thank you. So Laura, we understand that you, uh, the Corey will be leaving at 2.30. I don't know if the closed captioning 
works for you. And so, but we certainly welcome you to stay with us. Um, yeah, that, that would be totally fine. I'm happy to do that and I can read the captioning. Okay. I just really appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of you all today. That's great. I only wish we were in person in the state house. It would be much more fun. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, someday, someday soon for sure. Yep. So I think committee, what we'll do, uh, were there any more questions for Laura? Okay. I think what we'll do, oh. And just to just uh, to add, if you don't mind, you are more mm -hmm. than welcome to contact me at any time. I'm always available um, to, to communicate via email or set up a separate time to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. If, yes. if, if I could just articulate and maybe Madam Chair, you have a different plan in mind, but I don't necessarily see legislative counsel here, but I, I could offer to get um, Laura and, and Amarin on the same email thread to make sure that our language is fully inclusive. So I just want to say that out loud if that's appropriate. Yeah, we will uh, when we get farther into the bill because we've only had a little bit with the bill so far. So we haven't started marking it up or doing anything, but we definitely will put Laura on. That's a great idea. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Absolutely sure. happy to take any of your suggestions as well. Thank you. So I, I think that what I'm gonna do right now is jump to Susanna um, because I, I just wanna know how this <coughs> fits in, complements, conflicts with whatever it does because I know that you are working on a, a language access project. And so we wanna make sure that whatever you're doing, we're helping you and complementing that project. So Susanna, would you like to join us? Yes, I would, thank you. For the record, Susanna Davis, Executive Director of Racial Equity for the state. Is my volume okay? Perfect. Okay. So I don't want to step on any other testimony that may cover the same topics that I'm covering. So I'm going to speak briefly about four main topics. One is applicability. The next is accessibility. The third is accountability. And the last is quality control. Let me begin by saying that we are very eager to create a language access plan. It's no secret to this committee, since this committee is where I give every annual report, that a comprehensive language access plan has always been the goal, and that we did early on begin doing some of the footwork to legwork. <laughs> like to work towards that. We conducted a survey of our agencies and departments in 2019 and received a lot of important and helpful feedback in response. The first thing that I'd like, so, so I'm grateful that this bill exists and I just wanted to highlight some of what I see as potential roadblocks. So first, I'd like to talk about applicability. The bill, I think, is a great start. And perhaps I am misreading, but it appears to apply to executive agencies, which are a huge chunk of state government. But in my reading, there isn't clear ties that apply it to the judiciary or to the legislature. And the reason I raise this is because the enabling statute for the Racial Equity Advisory Panel and the Executive Director of Racial Equity states very clearly that our work is supposed to happen across all three branches of state government. And specifically, one of the statutory requirements is that this office work across all three branches to identify systemic racism and also to develop performance targets and metrics 
for the executive, the judiciary, and for the legislature. The judiciary has done a lot of work on this already. They've worked with federal partners and have created a robust language access program and have dedicated staffing to this as well. And we would expect that because language access in the courts is absolutely life or death. It is critical to people's outcomes that they be able to have access to justice in court settings. It is also critical that people be able to have access to state services, whether they're dealing with the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Health Department, the Department of Taxation, or anything in between. So a focus on executive agencies is also very appropriate. And I'm happy to report that a number of the executive agencies and departments have also advanced their language access work in the last couple of years particularly in the Agency of Human Services portfolio, we have a lot more comprehension and consistency in language access. There's certainly a lot more way to go. Um, and then Department of Public Safety has at least been aware of the conversation um, and other agencies and departments as well have been made more aware of obligations, not just for federal compliance, but also so that we can go above and beyond those minimums. So on this first point of applicability, the Racial Equity Office feels extremely strongly that for this work to work, it must be applicable across all three branches of state government so that people can participate in shaping their futures, not just when the laws are interpreted in the courts or enforced in the agencies, but when they're being created in the legislature. The second point was going to be on accessibility, but fortunately, Laura was here and was able to um, give that testimony in much greater detail, but what I was going to say in short was precisely what Laura said, which is that ASL and other forms of non-spoken language should be included as well in a comprehensive plan. The next thing I'd like to talk about is accountability. So some of the bill provisions begin to wade into whose responsibility it is to develop these plans and whose responsibility it is to track them. We note that the chief performance officer is tasked with tracking compliance and reporting on it. And while that's a great office to utilize for tracking and compliance generally, we feel that specific to language access planning, that work is better suited in the racial equity office. So our suggestion is that the racial equity office be charged with conducting that tracking and reporting. We also know that cross-branch communication and even cross-agency communication has to be finessed and has to be well-oiled. The reason for that is information sharing can sometimes be tough across different agencies or branches. There may be personally identifiable information concerns when we aggregate that information from our sister agencies or other branches or other parts of the executive branch for that matter, because of course the executive branch is more than just everything under the governor's purview, but also includes the auditor, the treasurer, the attorney general, the defender general, and others. So as we think about all of those scopes of work and the different roles that each of our agencies or branches plays in the community, we also have to take the time to create a plan that allows us to talk to each other, share those, inform share those data, and make sure that when we report them, or if they are made publicly accessible, that that's done in a way that doesn't create adverse consequences for the people who are represented in the data. Some agencies receive inquiries and their involvement with the public is mainly by fielding uh, 
uh, inquiries or, or questions. And other agencies are more proactive in reaching out. I'll give one example. We know that generally the courts more often have people reaching out to them, whether they want to file a motion or whether they want to bring an action. Whereas agencies like human services, specifically the Department of Health, do a lot more proactive outreach in the community. And so access in each of those spaces is going to look a little bit different. Having a comprehensive plan that accounts for that is going to help us make this process more smooth and understand what are the minimums to which we should be adhering and what are the ways we can go above and beyond. All of this is to say that timing is a big piece of this. Uh, we know that the bill will likely have its dates updated, but even if the timeline remains the same in terms of length of time, we're very concerned about being able to pull all of this together within that timeline and do it correctly. The next and last thing I wanted to mention is quality control. And I think that if, I'm not sure if HRC is on the line, um, I know this was one of their concerns as well. So I don't wanna to speak too much about it, but I will say a bit about quality control. One of the things that we really love about this bill is that it encourages using services from community translators and community interpreters. And this is important. One, because this is a way that we can engage people who are already part of Vermont's community in governance and in spaces where they've already been. And two, because it helps to build trust. And whenever we talk about historically marginalized or oppressed or underrepresented groups, trust always is a huge factor. So we appreciate and co-sign the encouragement to work with community translators and we also recognize that not every multilingual person can translate. And there's a certain standard of quality that we have to make sure translators and interpreters can meet. Because again, in settings like court hearings, family law proceedings, when determinations are being made about people's life outcomes, one misunderstood word could be the difference between taking a plea or not. So we want to make sure that certification is front and center. And that is true both for any community translators we intend to contract with, as well as any non-community translators. I mentioned non-community translators because while we do prefer to have a local focus in Vermont, we also know that the set of most commonly spoken languages in Vermont is not the same as it is in many other parts of the country. And for that reason, we may have to look to a more national pool to be able to have the number and availability of translators necessary for a truly comprehensive statewide plan. When we talk about community translators, it's not just about getting them up to certification standard, but also about making sure we're fairly compensating people for their work. After all, the way that things stand today, we often have people stepping in last minute to do translations. And that often pulls them away from other duties. This comes at an opportunity cost. And so helping people be whole, whether it's replacing wages lost from them having to step in for us, or creating a more structured and predictable payment structure through which they can have a more consistent compensation is key. I'm reminded that in September of 2020, the Racial Equity Task Force made a set of recommendations and one of those, rec well, at least four of those recommendations were for expanded language access. But one of them specifically was to increase support for multilingual liaisons in schools. They are an overworked and undervalued part of communities 
who don't just serve as interpreters for students and don't just serve as interpreters for families. They're serving as resources, as information hubs. They're serving as points of contact for people who need to be connected with other social services. This is a position that on paper has to do with language access for students, but in reality plays a much more critical foundational role in communities that cannot be overstated. We still feel strongly that multilingual liaisons are part of this community of interpreters and translators and also are social workers and also are liaisons to government. And so when we think about compensation and the full roster of people who perform this sort of work for us to our benefit, these are the things we need to consider. And so as we think about advancing any bill or any policy on language access, it is extremely important that we consider the fiscal impact of having to recruit and train and sustain the people who are going to be doing the work, as well as the technological infrastructure that we'll need in order to track it, and potentially any staffing resources that may need to be augmented. Now, earlier I mentioned that the Office of Racial Equity is well suited to do this tracking. And I'm confident that with the existing staff that, has, that have already been approved, that we can accomplish this without an added need. However, this is just one office in one agency in one branch. So I would encourage us to consider how the legislature and the judiciary may also need to have budgets re-examined to account for and support the scope of work that we're asking for. I have done my best to refrain from speaking quickly. And so uh, I'm going to pause here so that I don't eat up all of your hearing, but I appreciate your time and thank you for your attention. Thank you, and I have to say, I've never heard you speak so slowly. It, it hurt. <laughs> it was, you did a very good job, thank you. So my, I guess my question is, and I, <coughs> there are some really good things in this bill. My question is, and not to, not to discount anything that's in here, but is this bill needed or is what's needed for you to come back with a report saying, this is where we need to go now, because it sounds like you're already doing a lot of this and working on these. And, um, and instead, what we need to do is, um, as a legislative branch, we need to look at our own, how we, how we function. But I, so I, I don't, um, I know that there are, really good things in this bill, but I'm just wondering, is, is it needed or is what you're doing addressing these needs and you can do it without the bill? I think it is the latter. And I say that with deepest respect to the sponsor because I know that Senator Rom Hinsdale has been a tireless advocate for underrepresented and marginalized communities. So the purpose of the bill and the outcomes it sets out are absolutely needed. However, I do think that this is achievable without the legislation in a way that will give us the leeway to be able to do this correctly and not, um, not anchor the work based on a fixed timeline, but rather anchor it based on identifying the need. So, so it, go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say it, it would be our request that the committee consider holding off to provide us the opportunity to work cross branch with judiciary and legislature and other offices in the executive to create something genuinely comprehensive and statewide. So maybe what we need to do is we need to set up, and I hate to, to say this, but set up some kind of a summer study committee that the legislature has um, input into that looks at what the legislature your legislative branch needs to do around 
language access. Madam Chair, I certainly would support that. Um, and I want to accompany that by saying that what I don't want to do is kick this can down the mm -hmm. road. I, mm -hmm. I have said many times before, my, my first words were not in English. And I grew up in a household where not everybody was an English speaker. But I have immense privilege um, to, to speak this language. And so it is easy for me to say, let's wait. Mm -hmm. because I am not a person who is limited English proficient. So what I don't want to do is to create burden or delay or disappointment for mm -hmm. communities who need this work. Um, and, I, and I have to say that out loud because it is tremendously important that we do. And I also believe that this will be best and strongest if we if we really take the time, look at judiciary's example, look at AHS's example, and look at other jurisdictions as well. So I, I would support a committee with the simultaneous commitment that this is not just a, a stalling tactic. So I'm gonna make a suggestion. I think that, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I know that we're not gonna be able to do much before crossover, because that's two weeks. But I don't think that we are getting a ton of bills sent over to us from the House to deal with after crossover. So perhaps we can make a commitment to spend um, a number of days working as a summer study committee might, but working on it in this committee after crossover and really trying to figure out what the what we as a legislative branch need to do. Uh, Senator Rahm himself. Well, Madam Chairman, first of all, I'm I'm grateful that you know you'd be looking to have a conversation on a leadership level about giving this more time. Um, you know, I, I don't want to rush anything or give it just a two week window when we think we may have more time and capacity. Um, just a couple other reactions. You know, one, Susanna, you may know this, but I just want to make sure those listening know that um, I absolutely hear you on the multicultural, multilingual liaison piece. And I introduced S27 last year, which allowed um, municipalities and school districts to share those positions without any kind of penalty in terms of the how the district financing works. Um, which ultimately passed in S16. And so, you know, it is a small step toward recognizing how important those folks are. Um, but I think that was a really critical step, knowing that we're now, again, going to go into breaks like winter break and summer break, where at least Burlington and Winooski have been able to start to take advantage of this uh, partnership and make sure that on vacation breaks, um, people don't lose access to, as you said, their social worker. That's what a lot of people called that person supporting them. And that was a lifeline for them that they lost last summer as the pandemic was raging. Uh, given that particular example, um, what I'm most worried about is that there is a fast moving disaster that hits Vermont and we are not currently prepared to offer lingual services uh, for all who will, who will need them to get the information they need in an emer on an emergency basis. And so, you know, I want, as you do, a comprehensive language access plan and one that has the flexibility um, to get it right. I, am a, I, I wonder if you think if there was, you know, um, a major flooding event that came through the state this week, if the state would be pre better prepared than it was at the start of the pandemic to ensure language services for all who need them? I actually do because early on in the pandemic, we had entities that came together like the Multilingual Task Force, which now has a new name. And I'm gonna apologize to that group uh, because I, the name escapes me now, but that was a team that was put together and built up into something really incredible. And with their assistance and their guidance and their intervention and their advocacy, the state has, I think, made some real strides in refining its emergency communications. 
Laura spoke earlier about captioning and signing at press conferences. And the information we have is that occasionally that is still a little bit spotty, but that for the most part, that is a system that runs fairly smoothly. Uh, additionally, we have a dedicated funding stream for continued emergency communication translation running through the Agency of Human Services, specifically VDH, and have also expanded the health equity, no, yes, the health equity and community engagement team. There is a new director there who also I believe is a, a bilingual person. And the team is being expanded to I think 19 people um, several of whom are already in place and who are multilingual and um, perhaps more of whom will be. That is a big part of the response because it helps us to have eyes and ears on the ground to make sure that we're not hearing from the community too late in the game. The third thing I'll say is that we have a number of departments that do work um, in sort of the emergency space. I'm thinking of the Emergency Operations Center, Public Safety, Fire Safety, et cetera. And I do think that they also have, between their links with federal emergency responses, response divisions, and the state ones we have, I do think that we probably would be not awful if a flood hit tomorrow. Not awful. <laughs> That's better than awful. <laughs> that which we were at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> Okay, are there any questions? Oh, Senator Clarkson, did you have a question? I just oh. said it would be awful for other reasons. Yeah, yes, it would be. We do not want to think of a, a, a widespread emergency, but it could happen. So any, any questions for Susanna? Thank you very much, Susanna, and I, um, I appreciate uh, your input. And um, I like the way you broke down your four points and then addressed each of them. That was helpful. Thank you very much. Yes, Senator Clarkson. Susanna, Susanna I, I guess I have a question, which is your sort of your uh, a closer timeline on this. I know the task. I mean, working on this in the next bit would be great. I mean, do you have a? Hmm, I guess that's sort of our next step forward. I, I was just thinking if you had an overarching timeline on more of this work. I actually don't have a precise timeline that I would recommend. And it's precisely because I think that we need to hear from more people to get a better, a better assessment. For example, our, I did confer with our chief performance officer. Um, the, I know that the one year proposal was of concern to him from a project management perspective. And we also heard from the judiciary who did implement their own language access protocol, who also had uh, concerns about, about that timeline. So I would certainly lean on them and also on the uh, legislative branch as well so that we can understand what can we do and how soon can we do it. We're at a point right now, it's, you know, I, was, I was talking um, to some of your colleagues recently who said we're at a point now in budget where we've got to make some tough choices. And, um, and I heard someone else say, actually, no, the recession was tough choices time. Right now is quite the opposite because of all of the money coming into the state. So I think that we, we can get this right, but we just, um, I, I don't think that a year, and I apologize, I didn't look, um, I need to re-look at the bill again to see the precise timing, but I did hear from judiciary who has done it and CPO who does project management, um, that they were both concerned about the timeline. Thank you. Any other questions for Susanna? I mean, okay, yes, Senator Ramsdale. You know, so I guess I just want to say it, it has been longer than a year, right? And especially for the judiciary, um, this is a civil rights act protection, and you know, I do wonder. Um, Two things. One, you know, how the if, if it makes sense to speak with um, the administration's chief counsel, you know, about how the state would be thinking about prioritizing and the all branches of government should be prioritized in terms of investment 
and what can be done in a year. Um, because I think everyone saying we need more than a year is, is really concerning. Um, and two, how much is the state currently spending on, um, on spoken interpretation and non, I, I don't know if you know the non-spoken interpretation piece. Yeah, I do think it would definitely be appropriate to look at how we wanna prioritize it. Um, of course, the federal regulation, which is the Civil Rights Act, and then also the executive order from the Clinton era, both describe meaningful access which is loose enough to allow for nuance, um, to allow for what is your typical catchment area or demographic. So for example, if the agency of transportation tends to deal with these 10 languages mainly, uh, and if these five documents like driver license applications, dri you know, driver privilege cards and uh, registration applications, if those are the three most commonly accessed forms by and large, then we know that we need to prioritize the most commonly accessed forms in the most commonly spoken languages. However, if by contrast, we know that, and I'm just making this up here, let's just say the Department of Liquor and Lottery tends to interact mainly with Spanish and French speakers, and they tend to have generic application being, um, being sought most commonly, then the federal regulation effectively says, you know, start with that, look at what is most common and what is most sought. So I think it would be certainly appropriate to, to think about how we're gonna prioritize those. I know that again, when we did that survey and it was a little bit a while ago now, so we may have to do um, a new one post COVID or during COVID, but we did get some insight of, from those agencies about what contacts they have with limited English proficient communities. Um, the second question, what is the state spending right now? I actually don't know. I do believe the bulk of it is coming through the AHS portfolio. And I know that because of COVID-19, a lot of that money has been diverted from federal funds to pay for this. So we probably are piecing together a patchwork of funding stream, or I should say braiding funding streams to cover it. So I don't have a, a, a fixed number for you, but I can try to find out. While, so, while we're on the topic, sorry, of transportation, Amila might be able to speak to this as well. I think the value of a task force and or a language access plan is to also think about languages that are just starting to be requested because we may be bringing new populations into our state. And there's already been a lot of concerns raised about, you know, while we're very proud that we finally have the driver's written exam um, trans interpreted into other, um, translated into other languages, the manual is not. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there are still a lot of people um, who for a year, that's a really long time to wait to access, you know, transportation and the economic benefit that comes with that. So I do think, you know, being responsive and nimble is still just really critical, as I know you're aware of. Completely agree, Senator. I, I, I completely agree. It's, um, it's not just about the data we have. It's also about who's not captured. Uh, there may be a chilling effect. If I know for a fact that you don't have it in my language, I'm not, I may not come, I may, I may not bother coming to you to ask for it. That doesn't mean there's not a need. It means that I was shut down before I got started. So I, I'm 100% in agreement on that. And I suppose I should clarify because I think I, I didn't say this well about the, the timeline. I don't want to suggest that we can't implement broader language access until a year plus from now. I'm thinking mainly about the um, tracking, reporting, and that kind, of, that kind of workflow. I think that there's a lot that we can do sooner rather than later. And I would like us to do the high priority and quick items as soon as possible. We don't need a year for that. Um, but the, the timeline where it does concern me is when we talk about like filing formal plans and having a tracking system and delivering a report to the legislature that may or may not necessarily ha reflect the full body of what we're doing or what we're thinking. So I don't wanna suggest that none of the work can happen in a year because that's unreasonable. So I'm going to suggest committee that um, we are I think we had something else scheduled at 2.45. We got off the floor a little bit late, but um, I don't know if committee members, if you feel a need to take a break or if we can just
do this for another 10 minutes and then jump to our next topic. <laughs> I guess nobody feels strongly one way or the other. So we'll, I think that what we'll try to do is um, close, uh, wrap this up today. And I'm gonna try and put it on for uh, discussion next Wednesday. Um, and I'll try and put it on next Wednesday at four, I think, because we have something scheduled at 1.30 and something at 3.15, but I think we can put this on at four. Linda, did you have a question? I have a couple of things uh, piggyback on Susanna's comment. Is it okay that I say it because it's related? Yep, if you can do it quickly, that's just great. Thank you. I think last time I babbled so quick in 10 minutes, so <laughs> which I speak. Um, it's great to see everyone here and thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, I appreciate um, Senator Ram Heistai um, um, introduced this bill. And uh, if people, well, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Linda Lee. Uh, my birth name is Lee Lai Ah, and I am, um, a social worker by training, and uh, I am the um, National Association of Social Worker Vermont Chapters President. Um, um, I, I am a child therapist as my pay job. And i um, so glad to see so many familiar uh, faces in here. Um, in fact, um, I have been working with uh, Laura and Corey on the certification of the licensure. Uh, with interpreters, both spoken and um, um, foreign language or non-spoken language. Um, and I want to piggyback, I really, really um, appreciate um, Susanna, your thoughtful, clear point by point. Um, I do, we do believe that that um, certification as ensure system, once it's set up, it will have create a trickle effect on one, getting a standard pay for interpreters and better pay career path and also would help um, push insurance company to reimburse for services so that more in, in such a state or um, uh, grant funded organization could provide interpreters, increase many, you know, access. And I also want to, um, point out that the, uh, staff training is needed to how to work with interpreter within the agency. Um, just because you put, you put this um, 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 regulation in, in the agency, um, they follow, but like the, do they, does the, does the interpreters know? I mean, does the staff say, for example, DCF staff know how to work with an interpreter inappropriate? manner in the um and also um i do agree that it's actually um illegal to ask staff member to take their time from their job to interpret um this is actually labor um, um challenges so um i thank you susanna for pointing them out one last minor thing that um vermont has a protection for social worker titles um for so that means um uh, people who are doing the social work work but not didn't go to school for social work, um, we try not to call them social workers. So I know liaison is so important and, and they are doing um, all the social work stuff. Um, I just wish you know they can all go to social work school for free <laughs> so that they could you know um, um, really get the, the, the title and, and the um, um, the the whatever that they deserve. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us again. So I am going to suggest that um, we now wrap this up and come back on um, next Wednesday at four o'clock to for co committee discussion on where we go next. Does that work? Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us. It was 
Nice to see you here again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. Thanks. See you next week. Yep. Bye. Bye. So committee, can, do we need to take a two minute break or are you all, are you okay? Okay, we need a two minute break. Okay, be back in two minutes. Gail, I don't think you even have to.